me, Marilyn. I'm here. Okay, we're all here then. So, uh, welcome everyone to um, Peofik Amelie's uh, dissertation defense. Um, I know that he's worked uh, very hard and has talked with everyone on the committee to try and make sure that uh, all the questions that you had during his proposal were answered. And um, so, as you know, Teofik uh, first came to Georgia Tech, and he was a scholarship student from um, a university, and I apologize, I cannot pronounce all of these things, um, <laughs> in, in, in Nigeria. And uh, then he has transitioned to a, a graduate teaching assistant over the past uh, couple of years when um, that funding went into trouble through no fault of his own. And so today he's going to talk about his uh, potential theory that he has come up with to try to improve um, Reynolds numbers or different Reynolds numbers approximations on canonical bluff bodies. So Teofik, uh, go ahead. I ask everyone to please mute your audio. Um, if, you, if the committee has a question, uh, go ahead and unmute and ask. For those of you who aren't on the committee, please wait. At the end, we will um, take questions. Uh, committee members, I will be trying to write down your questions and comments as we go along. Go ahead, Teofik. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, the title of my thesis uh, presentation is A Refined Potential Theory for the Incompressible Unsteady Subcritical Reynolds Number Flows on Canonical Bluff Bodies. I'll be discussing seven things and in this presentation. I'll start with an introduction and the research motivation, then I'll talk about the aim and objectives, uh, and then I'll describe the refined potential theory uh, on the circular cylinder and uh, I'll discuss the verification and validation on the circular cylinder. And then I will uh, also discuss the application of the theory uh, onto uh, the flow on uh, a sphere and a sphere. And then I'll draw some conclusions uh, after which I'll make recommendations for future research. After this, I'll have a slide on publication and acknowledgements, and then the rest of the slides for the references are uh, references uh, there are three main approaches in which the governing equations of uh, fluid dynamics can be uh, explored. Either it is done by pure experiment or pure experiment or uh, numerical experiment, that is computational fluid dynamics or pure theory. Uh, when uh, the pure experiment is used, uh, for instance, in the case of the uh, Reynolds number 100 flow over the circular cylinder depicted in this uh, figure, uh, the advantage is that the physics of the flow can directly be observed. For instance, uh, the uh, shedding of the vortices in the von Kármán uh, vortex street here is, um, can be seen. Uh, uh, however, um, uh, experiments can be limited in the, uh, there can be practical limitations to the parameter space that can be explored in experiments. Uh, experiments can also take time relatively, and also um, they can be costly. Uh, when the computational fluid dynamics approach is used, uh, uh, the computational fluid dynamics approach can offer an avenue to explore uh, a, a more, uh, a wider variety of parameter space as compared to experiments. However, there are also practical limitations to uh, uh, low Reynolds number flows uh, yeah, for instance, uh, uh, CFD is able to also capture the features of the flow um, at this Reynolds number, like the one come up Vortex Street. Uh, but uh, also, CFD can be expensive and also it can be time consuming. When a pure theory is used, in this case, the classical potential theory over the circular cylinder, it can offer a relatively uh, 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 less expensive and uh, less time-consuming approach to the problem. However, uh, classical potential theory is not able to capture the uh, viscous effects uh, uh, that are present in the flow. For instance, at this same Reynolds number, uh, the state of the art of the classical potential theory does not feature any shedding of wakes or 
uh, the, uh, um, the one from text street. And it doesn't also, uh, it's also uh, two dimensional. So going forward, the governing equations of fluid flow are the continuity equation uh, for the incompressible flow that is, are the continu continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equation. The continuity equation is a statement of the mass conservation uh, in the flow, and it's given by equation one here. For an incompressible flow, the density field is uh, taken to be constant, and so uh, the transient duration of density goes to zero, and we are left with uh, uh, the equation that the divergence of velocity is equal to zero for all time. Uh, in equation two, the Navier-Stokes equation is uh, are presented in uh, a vector form where the rule of vorticity has been made obvious here. And this is also written for uh, a constant property uh, Newtonian fluid. Here, uh, lambda is the second coefficient of viscosity and mu is the first coefficient of viscosity. Uh, so classical potential theory rests on the fact that uh, the a velocity field of an incompressible flow satisfies the Laplace equation. Uh, and with that, it um, defines uh, functions like the classical velocity potential and the classical stream functions, both of which satisfy uh, the requirement that the divergence of the velocity field equal to zero. However, they satisfy this with uh, one more condition that the vorticity, the vorticity field is equal to zero. Um, uh, when that is the case, the, the velocity potential is defined uh, and the stream function also satisfies uh, the Laplace equation. Otherwise, when the vorticity field is non-zero, the uh, veloc classical velocity potential is not defined uh, uh, and uh, the stream, classical stream function satisfies the Poisson equation. In figure two here, the streamlines um, predicted by classical potential theory is seen to be similar to figure three, uh, which is a case of an actual flow over the circular cylinder. That is uh, with a qualitative assessment of the streamline. But when a quantitative assessment of the results uh, uh, is made, we see that uh, the Reynolds number limits, uh, for instance, the classical potential theory would be expected to match uh, actual flows in the implicit limits when the Reynolds number tends to infinity. However, this is not the case because uh, uh, it only matches um, the case of an actual flow when the Reynolds number is around 1.54 here. Uh, also, a classical potential theory predicts zero drag on the body, whereas there's always some drag uh, experienced by a body in a flow. Uh, I had mentioned that the vorticity field, uh, uh, the requirement that the vorticity field is equal to zero is an uh, assumption for classical potential theory. Uh, in actual flows, uh, vorticity is always present, particularly close to the body and in the wake. So there is this gap between uh, the classical potential theory and uh, actual flows that needs to be filled. Uh, going further, uh, these are the expressions for the classical velocity potential and the classical stream function for the non-lifting flow over the circular cylinder. It can be seen here, it can be seen here that uh, they do not feature any terms for uh, viscosity uh, nor any terms for uh, time. Uh, and because the, uh, because the uh, classical potential, sorry, is there a So uh, going forward, uh, because uh, because the classical potential theory is on the fact that the hello can you mute your audio please? Sorry about that. Because the classical potential theory rests on the fact that the, uh, the, uh, the flow field satisfies the Laplace equation, um, the superposition principle uh, <coughs> holds, and that is uh, to be seen here, where the stream function expression 
is um, obtained with the superposition of a uniform flow over a doublet flow to have the flow over the circular cylinder. So the aim of the uh, research then is to bridge the gap between classical potential theory and actual flows in order to enhance the ability to predict, forecast, and control the aerodynamic quantities of the flow, as well as the evolution of the wake for design purposes. Um, the objectives are first to develop a standard on theoretical solution over a finite uh, circular cylinder, then map the flow to spheres and spheroids, and then go to the verification and validation of the solution against experimental numerical solutions for the circular cylinder. And then the last one is to validate the application to spheres and spheroids. This, before going forward, this is an overview of the existing gap. Um, this, um, these five um, requirements are met by classical potential theory uh, as well as actual flows. I've put the question marks here because uh, uh, the modifications of the classical potential theory to, um, to satisfy these requirements will be discussed in this presentation. Uh, these are where the classical potential theory fall, falls short. Um, uh, the, the fourth uh, seven are viscous effects, and the last is um, uh, the transient effect. If uh, in order to fulfill some of this, I'll be introducing some idea from uh, orbital mechanics, particularly in order to be able to obtain the forces in the uh, on the cylinder. So here I. Uh, will explain the reasoning behind using the gravitational analogy. Uh, in, figure, in figure 5a on the left, uh, we, uh, it presents uh, the various orbits that um, an orbiting body around a dominant body of gravitation can um, uh, occupy when it's orbiting. Uh, it's depending on the eccentricity of the orbit. The eccentricity is the degree of uh, how circular the orbit is. So when the eccentricity is equal to zero, it's a circular orbit. When it is greater than zero or less, and less than one, it's an elliptic orbit. When it is uh, equal to one, it's a parabolic orbit. When it's greater than one, it's, an, um, it's a hyperbolic orbit. Uh, on, in figure B, the streamlines of the flow, of an actual flow at Reynolds number 26 is presented. By analogy, a fluid element arriving at the a stagnation point flows around the cylinder and occupies um, states attached to the cylinder, that is to the influence of the cylinder, and occupies uh, something like a circular or elliptic orbit. And then when it goes, to, goes around the cylinder and separates away from the cylinder, it's uh, uh, occupying, by analogy, um, a parabolic or a hyperbolic orbit. So uh, I'll also be talking about uh, the perifocal frame of reference. Uh, and the perifocal frame is a planar frame in which an orbital motion takes place. Uh, here, um, the motion of uh, a smaller body, M2, as it goes in orbit around a, a bigger body of uh, gravitation in the focus is described here. And it's also um, an equation four describes the orbit. Equation four is a solution of, the, uh, of Newton's second law of motion as applied to this um, problem. Here, the uh, radial coordinate system R, sorry, the radial coordinate variable R is equivalent to var rho. In this equation, H is the specific angular momentum of the orbiting body mu g is a gravitational parameter, which is a product of the mass of uh, the, uh, the mass of the uh, two-body system and the gravitational constant. Uh, epsilon is the eccentricity of the orbit, and uh, the big theta is, um, uh, is the circumferential coordinate in the orbit. Uh, I'll refer to this as the, as the true anomaly, which is the term used in orbital mechanics. Uh, this, the variables in this expression can all be exp uh, can all be derived from a knowledge of the velocity of the orbiting body, and here it should also be uh, noted that um, 
with the use of the gravitational analogy, the mass of to the cylinder flow, the mass of the cylinder um, gets into the uh, foregoing theory. So in order to get the velocity of the fluid element as it goes around the cylinder, uh, I'll go back to uh, the uh, um, the classical potential theory now. Hey, uh, okay. May I ask a question? This is Dr. Ruffin. Okay. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Can you no. go to slide nine, please? Slide nine. Okay. okay. So where you're introducing this analogy here. Okay. Um, so I wonder if you can just tell me a little bit more about it. I know you. I know you're going into additional details, but um, so how do you treat this if the body, you know, the, the body on the right and the geometry on the left, they're both symmetric about uh, horizontal axis. Okay. Uh, so how do you treat it when the body is not horizontal? Um, in the gravitational analogy, I think the idea is that it's a point mass and it's going to affect things, you know, in each direction similarly. So, what about non-symmetric aerodynamic bodies in this analogy? Well, the detailed assessment of such uh, is what I'll also be um, recommending in future work. Here, uh, the assumption is that um, the this symmetry will be um, uh, the assumption is that this symmetry is there and that um, uh, the mass distribution is homogeneous. However, I'll be recommending uh, a further assessment of the case that you've just mentioned. So you're, you're going to mainly, your validations are really, are mainly with uh, symmetric bodies and, and not asymmetric ones? Yes, they are only with symmetric bodies. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the velocity field is the gradient of the classical velocity potential as it is presented in equation six. It satisfies the governing equations um, here, the Navier-Stokes equation in equation seven, because uh, the divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero and um, the uh, vorticity vector is also equal to zero. So here, because the vorticity is equal to zero, this goes out. Because the divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero, this goes out. Uh, the vot yeah, this also goes out. However, it is uh, the uh, classical velocity potential is non-physical because there's always vorticity present in the flow, in, in an actual flow, that is. Um, for the classical stream function, the velocity field is the gradient of a scalar of uh, classical stream functions. Uh, it's, so, sorry, it's the curl of the vector of classical uh, stream functions. Um, the classical stream function is uh, physical uh, because it does, um, it can also offer some vorticity in its formulation. However, uh, it's, it doesn't satisfy the um, Navier-Stokes equation identically because of the cross derivative term here and the vorticity term. So, but uh, in order to go forward, you see that uh, to satisfy um, the governing equations, uh, the a function needs to be some kind of potential function. Uh, and it's also, in order for it to also be physical, it needs to be some kind of stream function. Uh, so this, uh, the Kwasu function, the Kwasu is an acronym for Kora State University in Nigeria. Um, the Kwasu function, when it is cast in the cylindrical coordinate system, the divergence of it is um, equivalent to the velocity field. And when it is in this uh, Cartesian coordinate system, uh, the gradient of it gives the velocity field. This is because it is defined on a principal axis, a principal Cartesian coordinate axis about which the vorticity is identically equal to zero. So when that is done, we have this expression in equation 11 from which the pressure can be obtained. Here it's seen that the lambda uh, second coefficient of viscosity is going to play uh, an important role in the application of uh, the refined potential theory. This figure and uh, some sub subsequent ones compare the 
um, the fields of the classical strain function and the classical velocity potential function and the Poisson function. Um, here, x tilde is the wind x-axis. We see here that the negative wind x-axis is coincident with the uh, negative body x-axis for the classical stream function and the classical velocity potential. Uh, however, for the definition of the classic, uh, for the definition of the Poisson function, the negative uh, wind x-axis is defined on the positive body uh, y-axis. That is to say that in the expression for um, for the classical stream function, the theta is um, um, substituted with uh, this expression to obtain the Poisson function. And this is for the non-lifting flow over uh, the cylinder. This slide uh, shows the, uh, the non-planar velocity field of the classical stream function. Here it is seen that to obtain a velocity uh, in a direction, the stream function needs to be uh, differentiated in a uh, direction perpendicular to where the velocity uh, uh, to the direction of the desired velocity component and th this is so in the cylindrical coordinate system as well as the Cartesian coordinate system for the classical uh, velocity potential um, the velocity component needs when it is the velocity component is obtained by differentiating a classical uh, uh, this classical potential function in uh, the same direction as uh, as where the velocity component is desired. And this is so uh, for this uh, cylindrical coordinate system as well as the um, Cartesian coordinate system. And this is why, the, by definition, the uh, classical velocity potential uh, is not able to have any vorticity in its formulation. However, for the uh, Poisson function, when it is in the cylindrical coordinate system, um, it is, the velocity is obtained by differentiating it in the direction perpendicular to where the, uh, the direction of the desired velocity component, much as, much as the same as how to do for the stream function. In the Cartesian coordinate system, because it is defined on this axis, it is a velocity potential and so the velocity components are obtained by differentiating in the same direction as the desired velocity components. So with these relationships uh, between the velocity fields, uh, this equation 12 is Top, obtained. Topic one, one okay. quick question for you. Please. Okay. Slide 16, can you show that? Slide 16, okay. So I'm curious about the, the VR, um, the radial velocity in the okay. top right. So yeah. white is zero radial velocity. Yeah. And yes. so you should have zero radial velocity at every location along the surface. So if you look at the front half, it, does it go to white on that front half? I can't see that. I, I see it in white half? in the front, yeah, front half. It should be white on the surface, right? The radial velocity should be zero at the surface. The left half. The, the right half. Left half. The left half. Um, I, I'm not able to see a white band around the body. Uh, this is because this is still um, uh, should I be seeing a white band around the entire surface at the surface um, let me just quickly. So let me rephrase this in a different way. Um, so this is the potential theory, and slide B or figure B looks like 
it's half potential theory and half Navier-Stokes theory, with half being a slip and half being a no slip, where the left half is no slip, sorry, is slip, and the right half is no slip. Um, I guess that's kind of confusing. Yes, uh, that is uh, very much, um, I see what um, the question is about. I'm just trying to see uh, why it is the case now. And it's it's true the radial velocity uh, for um, the classical potential theory uh, should equal to zero at every point because it's uh, the surface is impermeable. Um, um, So maybe you have to zoom it in more. I don't know. Um, so I, I don't think we can answer it here. Maybe maybe you have to zoom in on that. Maybe it's going to white. I I, I don't I, see it. I but would you agree uh, that it should. You agree that it should be white, though, right? Yes, All I that. agree. Yes, yes, yes. I agree that it should uh, be white. Um, okay. Yes, I do agree. Okay. All right. Let, let's move on because I don't I don't think we can. Tell you'd have to be on the screen to zoom it in and see what's happening. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, can I just continue from slide 18? That would be great with me, thank you. Okay, thank you. So equation 12 gives the uh, relationship between the uh, quasar function and the classical string function and the classical velocity potential. The string for surfaces described by the uh, quasar function are physical because when the cross product of uh, ds with v is uh, um, uh, calculated in the wind axis uh, for which uh, uh, phi equals a constant of phi over 2, and v phi equals uh, 0, uh, this product equals to 0. That means no flow goes across the stream uh, surfaces. And so to introduce the viscous effects and unsteadiness in the non-lifting flow over the cylinder, um, the, um, the approach is to replace the cylindrical surface with a viscous Sink source voltage sheet uh, that has the vortices and the sinks and the sources um, concentric, and then the strengths of uh, the sinks and the sources and the vortices are obtained from the uh, velocity field of the non lifting flow, and then their locations are de uh, defined by the dividing streamline of the non lifting flow. Uh, and uh, the strengths of the, uh, their strengths will, will, the variation of their strengths will be based on an observation of the actual physics. Uh, the physics of the actual flow. I forgot to mention on the first slide where I was uh, discussing the different approaches for fluid dynamics that uh, there is usually an interaction between uh, the theory experiment and uh, uh, CFD uh, and the interaction uh, in, in that figure the interaction is uh, signified with the double uh, arrows. So here in the foregoing theory two there will be some uh, observation of uh, actual flows to make um, some decisions in the theory that is being presented here. So uh, uh, for the surface vortex, for, vo for a vortex, the velocity, the circumferential velocity is given in equation 14, and the stream function is also, the classical stream function is given in equation 15. So the idea is to uh, get the, um, uh, the velocity field for the surface vortex from the non-lifting flow, use it to define the strength of the vortex, and then uh, define the strain function for the vortex. Since the assumption here is that uh, the vortex, the vortices and the sources and the sinks are concentric, the radial velocity field described with this strain function is used to, dis uh, to uh, get an expression for the strength of the sources and the sinks, and then uh, in equation 17, an expression is uh, obtained for the uh, stream function for the sources and the sinks. And to introduce uh, viscosity 
uh, viscous effects and um, uh, the time variable. Uh, the, uh, the vortices are going to be modeled as um, um, Lambosing uh, vortices. The Lambosing vortex um, model is an exact solution of the Never Stokes equation and it describes the uh, viscous diffusion of a line vortex. So here, uh, the initial circulation strength would be uh, described with the non-lifting flow here. So uh, in this slide I'll, uh, and the subsequent one, I'll describe the steps, about 15 of them, uh, to go through to obtain the uh, Poisson function. Uh, so step one, uh, we define the non-lifting flow on the static on the static grid, and then in step two, we obtain the initial surface vortex strength from the velocity field of the non-lifting flow. And in step three, we use that along with the Lambosian vortex model. And step four, we obtain the stream function for the surface vortex and also use the expression here, uh, the natural log of R, uh, small r over big R, uh, which is used to enforce the no slip at the surface. And then in step five, we obtain the strength of uh, the surface sink uh, source uh, from the, uh, from this, um, yeah, using the knowledge of the um, what uh, the stream function for the vortices. And then uh, in step six, we obtain an expression for the stream function for the sink and uh, the sink source. In step seven, we obtain an intermediate um, stream function which is the superposition of the inviscid non-lifting flow and the surface vortex uh, and the surface uh, along with the surface uh, sink source. And then at this step, we apply the gravity analogy. And in step eight, we calculate the orbital period of the fluid element uh, to, in order to be able to define uh, the, um, the velocity potential uh, in a classical velocity potential in the perifocal frame in step nine. And here we make the assumption of a homogeneous mass distribution. And in step 10, uh, we obtain the stream function, the perifocal stream function with this expression. And in step 11, the vortex shedding stream function is uh, obtained by uh, modifying um, uh, the stream function in step six with these expressions in the um, exponential term. Eta in this term uh, assumes a value of negative one in the leeward uh, face of the cylinder. And because it's in the exponent, uh, it introduces some periodicity into the solution when it's negative. Uh, in the windward phase, it assumes a uh, value of positive one, and there's no periodicity. Uh, the radial velocity is also allowed to have some transient variation. The details of this are all included in the thesis. And in step 12, uh, we obtain uh, the viscous um, and time dependent stream function, which is a superposition of the non lifting flow, the surface vortex, the surface sink source, the perifocal stream function, and the vortex shedding stream function. It is two-dimensional, it satisfies continuity, but it doesn't satisfy the Navier-Stokes equation identically yet. And so to make it three-dimensional, uh, we introduce the, um, the third coordinate variable for the, in the Cartesian coordinate system in the description of R. And then we, to define it on, the, on a principal axis of the flow, we make a substitution uh, theta equals actan x over y. Uh, when that is done, we have it to be a potential function in the Cartesian coordinate system. And it's also three dimensional and it's uh, unsteady, but it's only static, statically unsteady. It also satisfies the Navier Stokes equation. Uh, in order to uh, introduce some dynamic unsteadiness into the solution, we make the assumption that the displacement of the fluid elements in, as they flow around the cylinder are wave-like, and we construct uh, the displacement in each of the coordinate system as one-dimensional wave uh, problems. 
and then use the Dalemba solution and the, for one dimensional waves um, and the, um, uh, the Poisson function to have expressions for the displacement in each of the coordinates uh, uh, in each of the axes. Then in step 15, we define the dynamic grid uh, with these expressions and we repeat in step 16, we repeat uh, steps 2 to 12 on the dynamic grid. When that is done, we have the Lagrangian disturbance field uh, and it's uh, an instantaneous potential function. It um, satisfies the Navier Stokes equation and it's also dynamically unsteady. The, uh, the fluctuations that have been introduced into the refined potential theory are due to the, uh, the transfer variations in the exponential terms of the Eulerian Poisson function, and uh, that's one of the uh, one of the three means by which the, uh, by which the um, transfer variations have been uh, incorporated. The second one is the oscillatory displacement of the fluid element part. And then the third is the dynamic grid, which I've just explained now. The dynamic grid introduces large amplitude fluctuations. So to have the instantaneous Lagrangian mean quantities, the dynamic grid is dropped, and then we have the expression in equation, equation 19 uh, for an instantaneous Lagrangian mean quantity here for the Poisson function. The, uh, this is the Eulerian Poisson function, which is um, um, defined on a static grid. And this is some Stokes correction uh, quantity. Um, the Stokes drift velocity components are integrals of uh, the fluid element's local displacement. And other uh, uh, Stokes correction quantities are obtained uh, accordingly from the Stokes drift velocity components. So uh, as I, I highlighted earlier that the um, second coefficient of viscosity is important in the application of RPT. However, its determination is, um, there is no, there's no consensus in its, uh, on its determination in the literature. Uh, so here the observation is made that for incompressible flows, the uh, stagnation CP is fairly constant at the value of one over a, a, a wide Reynolds number range. So with the expression for the pressure uh, evaluated at this point, we have this expression for the uh, second coefficient of viscosity. So to obtain the forces, we go to the perifocal frame and um, express the velocity field uh, in this uh, manner in equation 21. And then with this uh, expression for the velocity field in the perifocal frame, we have the expression for the shear stress in the perifocal frame in equation 22. And then we have the expression for the uh, pressure coefficient in equation 23, also from the expressions for, for the velocity field. And, and neglecting other body forces then, we can do the integration from the leading edge to training edge and obtain the drag coefficient in equation 24 and the lift coefficient in equation 25. The limits of the integration um, uh, from leading edge to training edge in the perifocal uh, frame correspond to this uh, in the body axis. So to use the, uh, to apply the refined potential theory to other uh, uh, geometries, the body coordinate is described as uh, in this equation, xn, yn, and zn. For the final cylinder, xn is r cos theta, yn is r sin theta, and zn is b cos phi, where b is the half span of the cylinder, and r is the radius. For the sphere, these expressions are used, and the r is the radius of, its, of the sphere. For the spheroid, these expressions are also used, and A is the semi-major axis of the spheroid, B in the, along the x-axis, B the semi-minor axis along the y-axis, and Z the semi-minor axis along the z-axis. So the orientation of the body is factored in with the use of the Euler and Goose. However, with, in the code implementation, quaternions are used to avoid singularities when the pitching um, uh, the pitch angle approaches uh, uh, pi over 2. And 
or afterwards, the body radial coordinates as, uh, is then given with this expression.